The almighty hamstring muscles, important for walking, hiking, sprinting towards the crag, slowing down after you sprinted towards the crag, jumping for joy that you've reached the crag, and oh yeah, you know, the almighty heel hook. So the hamstrings and the injuries that may accompany them are not as straightforward as you may think until you understand the anatomy of them. Understanding the anatomy will give you that lipo moment which will help determine what may have caused the injury. It can help you learn how to test for it, what you need to do to treat and heal from it, and so forth. So let's get started and jump right into the anatomy. So let's start with the basics. There are actually four hamstring muscles, two on either side of our knee. So the two muscles on the outside are the biceps femoris long head and biceps femoris short head. The two on the inside are the semitendinosus and semimembranosus. Now the hamstring has two primary purposes, flexing the knee and extending the hip. So the genius that is the human body, there's one muscle on each side that does a better job at each one of those tasks. The biceps femoris long head is the better at the hip extension and the short head is better at the knee flexion. Then with the ones on the inside, the semimembranosus is observed more as the better hip extensor and the semitendinosus is the better knee flexor. So together, the four muscles act as an amazing unit to help with knee flexion and hip extension. They help stabilize the lower leg with both internal and external rotation and help stabilize our hip. This is important as we're moving through our heel hooks and forcing the hamstrings to handle the different angles that we put on it while we're climbing. Imagine you're like starting with your heel in one position and you have to rotate your body a different direction. You may transfer that load from one side to the other. The connection between, you know, when we're heel hooking on the rock and holding on, we have the core and then we have the hamstrings. If your hamstrings aren't properly engaged or properly trained, there's a massive piece of that puzzle that's gonna be lacking. Whereas when you're climbing and you have good engagement of your hamstrings, that's gonna help control from the lower leg to the hip. Then if your core is engaged and you got good hand positioning, it's gonna make that climb a lot easier. So the hamstring is an important and even dare say vital part of our ability to control from our hip to our core while we climb.
Hi, drum roll guys. What actually causes a hamstring injury? Too much force on the tissue. You suck! When we're climbing, we put a lot of tension on that tissue, especially when we do our heel hooks. And if we don't have the proper amount of training to like build up the force it's able to load, or you're just not warming your tissue up very well, you're gonna put too much load on it too quickly and you may expose yourself to an injury. Think about the actual average climbing session you have. If you're lazy about your warm up, you just hop straight on the wall. If you're good about your warm up, you usually just warm your upper body up, but probably don't even touch the legs. If you're great about your warm up, you'll add in some time on a stationary bike to get the legs and cardiovascular system fired up. But if you're not doing anything specifically for the hamstrings while expecting them to hold up half your body weight on the wall, you're setting yourself up for an injury. So the other cause is improper training. Now that we know the anatomy of the hamstrings, we know that they are integral for a variety of movement and stabilization of our lower body. If you don't understand those functions, you won't know how to train them, and you may be limiting yourself to certain unidimensional exercises that don't appropriately train all aspects of the hamstring muscle group. So take the stiff leg deadlift or like the T-pose or warrior three, for example. While this is a great exercise, it doesn't activate and train all four of the hamstring muscles, nor does it place the unique stressors on the muscles like we do with climbing. In other words, this exercise is too unidimensional for climbing, but we can make it better by making it multidimensional. We need to reach to three different positions to help bias each muscle. That way they get the individual training and are more accustomed to the different pressures we're placing on them while climbing. Now, the other mistake is not training the knee flexors. That's where our Nordic hamstring curls will come into play, which we're gonna talk a lot more about in the treatment section. Um, we'll mention in prevention as well and how they help with that, but you can't just do stiff leg deadlifts. You have gotta be able to train both the hip extensors and the knee flexors. In fact, with climbing, we depend a lot on the knee flexors. I mean, think about the position you're in while you're heel hooking, you're in a knee flex position. So we need to be able to train the, the hamstring muscles in that flex position. That way we're functionally training our muscles to prepare them for the movements that we're going to be doing on the wall. All right, so now that we understand the causes of a hamstring injury, let's get into testing before we move into treatment and prevention. Prevention. So just as a reference when we're talking about testing, we'll have all the test results laid out in a nice table at the end of this segment and in the show notes so you can more clearly understand your results and paint a better picture of your findings. Again, knowing the anatomy of the hamstring helps us to understand how to test for an injury and we'll use that information to determine which muscle we injured, which will then help us to determine our treatment. But before we get into that, let's break down how we will test our injury with the four categories of observation, palpation, range of motion, and tissue loading. So the first step is simple observation. You look for deformities, swelling, and or bruising. If you have like pain or the significant deformity, such as like a lump or other irregularity in the tissue, you may have a tear, which means you may need to go see a specialist or just be careful with the rest of your testing. More obvious observation will be bruising. The hamstring muscles are quite vascular, so a tear will likely cause some bruising. The extent of the bruising may be indicative of the amount of tearing. Same thing with swelling. If you have more swelling, that's more likely that you may have a tear. And again, more swelling can indicate the level of the tear. If you notice these issues, again, you may need to seek professional assistance uh, because you may need to get that tested further before you go in too far with any kind of treatment or rehab program. All right, so if you don't have any significant indicators with your observation, the next step is gonna be palpation. So palpation is simply using your hands to check the body structures for abnormalities, pain, swelling, etc. You're gonna to wanna to focus your palpation on the hamstring muscle origin, which is at the ischial tuberosity, which is basically your sit bone, as well as the muscle body itself, and finally, the insertion sites on either side of the knee. Findings during the palpation section will help with your results, but are not definitive themselves. Take a note of where you feel the pain and then use those results to help piece everything together when we get to the results section.
so the next section we'll do is simple range of motion. We wanna do that before we go through our tissue loading because going through active range of motion is in a sense light tissue loading. The first thing you wanna try and do is simply extend your leg behind you. If you can't do this, you have significant pain, you don't wanna load the tissue further. If you can, you'll then want to try and flex your knee. If you can do that without pain as well, you can move on to the tissue loading. If either of those cause you discomfort though, you don't need to go on to loading the tissue in the tissue loading section. You already have some information to determine your injury. You can always test the loading later when that range of motion becomes pain free. But again, we wanna try and avoid just like exacerbating the injury or producing pain. So if you have mild pain or discomfort with extending the hip or flexing the knee, don't go on to the tissue loading section. Just look at your results and the, the observation and palpation as well with that. All right, so you didn't observe anything too major. You're able to kind of palpate along and there weren't any like significant deformities and you could go through that full range without a lot of pain. Now's the time to test your ability to load the tissue. Now it's important to note with this tissue loading section that you wanna slowly increase the force that you load onto the tissue because pain is your stopping point and it can actually be a nice measurement for you to look at. If you put what you feel is like 20% effort into it and you already generate pain, then that's gonna be like a measuring point that you can use for later. Like say you test it again in a week and you do 60% load um, until you feel that same amount of discomfort you're already healing. You're going through that process and your tissues be able to adapt to those um, higher levels of force. So just go slow and stop when you have pain with tissue loading. To accomplish this, you simply need to push against something that won't move. First, test it by keeping your knee straight and simply trying to extend your leg behind you, pushing into a wall, for example. This is gonna put slightly more strain on the biceps femoris long head and the semimembranosus. So if this loading creates pain, it's likely one of those two muscles. If you have no pain or just mild pain with this, move on to testing with the knee bent. So the easiest way to test with the knee bent it's without actually like having someone else to help you there is simply to sit in a chair and dig your heel into the floor. You're gonna to wanna to slowly increase the force as you generate it, paying attention to your symptoms. So now that you've gone through all of your tests, here's what you would expect for each muscle. The biceps femoris long head being the most commonly injured muscle is the one that we're gonna go through first. So it's important to note that in the show notes, we'll have a summary of all the findings of the test to help guide your decision-making process. That way you don't just have to loop this a hundred times and write down everything that I say. So the biceps femoris long head will have findings including like bruising at any side of the back of the leg, but maybe more on the outside rather than the inside. Pain may be provoked with palpation to the outside of the knee or the ischial tuberosity up towards the butt or throughout the muscle group. Range of motion and tissue loading may be worse with hip extension rather than knee flexion, but you may have some with both. The biceps femoris short head is the next one we'll talk about. Here, the total symptoms you'd expect are gonna be bruising at the mid thigh or further down the leg and towards the knee, not as high up. It'll probably be also more lateral than medial as well. Palpation would be more painful on the outside of the knee and maybe in the muscle body and your range of motion and tissue loading may be worse with knee flexion, not as much with hip extension. All right, so now let's talk about the other two hamstring muscles on the inside of the leg. So the semimembranosus will have similarities to the biceps femoris long head with range of motion and tissue loading testing, but our findings will differ in location from the long head. The symptoms you would expect are bruising at any site of the back of the thigh, but maybe more on the inside rather than the outside. Pain may be provoked with palpation to the, like the inner aspect of the knee, muscle body, or up into that ischial tuberosity or towards the butt. And then range of motion and tissue loading may be worse with hip extension rather than knee flexion. The semitendinosus will have some similarities to the biceps for more short head with its range of motion and tissue loading, but will also differ in location from the short head. You'll expect bruising at any site of the back of the thigh, but maybe again more on the inside of the knee. Pain may be more provoked with palpation to the inside of the knee, the muscle body, or the ischial tuberosity. 
Range of motion and tissue loading may be worse with now knee flexion rather than hip extension. So that's one of the big differences between the semi-membranosus and tendinosus is that pain with the hip extension versus knee flexion. All right, as a super important side note, if most of your pain is coming towards that ischial tuberosity or like that sit bone right up at your butt, it probably is also gonna warrant an actual like in-person evaluation and you may even need to see an orthopedic specialist because it's a possibility that you have an avulsion fracture. So if you have that, you may need surgery or a much more conservative rehab plan. So if most of your symptoms are really focused up there and you're having a lot of pain or discomfort, go see a professional, get it evaluated, um, because if you have that avulsion fracture, you're gonna need a completely different rehab program. All right, so prognosis. The prognosis for a hamstring injury is really great if you actually do something about it. The chance for a recurring hamstring injury is high if you do not, which makes sense though, right? If you hurt your tissue, it'll get weaker. And not only that, if you hurt it, it was probably weak in the first place. I'm too weak. Oh, don't kill me. So if you don't do anything about it, you can expect to injure it again. But with appropriate training, as we talked about previously, you can significantly reduce the risk of a re-injury and you can even identify weaknesses in your training, which may even improve your climbing. So if you have a hamstring strain, you can expect like within two to three weeks to be performing most activities without pain, but you may not feel as strong and powerful again for maybe up to six, maybe eight weeks. If you have a more of a partial hamstring tear, you can expect weakness and some pain for possibly four to six weeks with the return of strength and activities at about eight to 12 weeks. All right, and just another note as a reminder, if you have like a full tear or an avulsion fracture, then you, you know, your timeline's gonna be a little bit longer and you're gonna wanna follow that protocol that's laid out for you by your rehab and orthopedic team. All right, time to talk about treatment. So for treatment, we're gonna break this down into stages for like acute, subacute, and chronic slash three modeling phases. The acute stage will be the first week, maybe two post-injury, subacute two to three weeks, and then the chronic remodeling is, is any time thereafter. So this treatment model is gonna be referring more to a hamstring strain and maybe a partial tear, whereas a full tear or an avulsion fracture are not gonna be covered as they warrant an orthopedic evaluation because they may even require surgery. If this is your case, your rehab will be guided by your orthopedic and rehab team. And if you're relying on this video for your rehab at that point, you may need a better PT or rehab team. All right, so in the acute phase or like that first week, maybe two, we wanna work on tissue mobility first. So that's one of the best things you can do is to simply mobilize the tissue. This may mean using your hand, a rolling pin, or even a foam roller. Be gentle, like you're not trying to produce a lot of pain. The purpose is just to keep mobility through the tissue and redirect blood flow. So also in the acute phase, if you discovered earlier that your like range of motion testing was pain-free, it's totally fine to go through that range of motion. In fact, it's really encouraged. You don't want to let the muscle get super stiff by just protecting it and not moving it at all. So acute, really good idea. Go through range of motion, make sure it's pain-free, and keep that muscle moving do these activities like range of motion and tissue mobilization multiple times a day, like two to five times a day. Just do it for a few minutes at a time or whatever feels good for your body, but keep it frequent because you want to keep that tissue moving within a pain-free range. All right, so now we're gonna look at the subacute phase, which would be like weeks two and three. We're gonna introduce stretching in this phase, like as long as you don't have a more significant injury, the subacute phase is a great time to start light and gentle stretching. You're gonna to wanna to start with your basic straight and bent knee hamstring stretching to make sure we're getting all components worked. The straight leg hamstring stretch you may be more familiar with, but I really wanna show you some more advanced movement with it. You're gonna prop your chair up, Bend forward at the waist, keeping your back straight, and then you're gonna wanna rotate that foot internally and externally, or just rotating the foot in and out. That's gonna help target the inner and outer muscles more. I like to call these the windshield wiper stretches, and that's gonna get us a complete coverage to get the hamstring muscles moving. As we discussed earlier too though, we, we really need to understand our anatomy, and that's gonna help us with our stretches. Just the straight leg stretch is not enough we need to do a bent knee hamstring stretch as well. So in this case, you're gonna prop your foot up again, but you're gonna keep your knee flexed or bent. Then you're gonna lean your chest forward as far as you comfortably can. You probably won't feel a stretch yet, 
But once your chest is really far forward, like chest down to your thigh, then you wanna start straightening your knee from there. You're gonna feel a totally different stretch this way, which is great. Now with this one, instead of trying to rotate the leg in and out, you're actually just gonna try and shift your hips left or right and feel that different stretch. Same thing within windshield wiper, like if you feel more stretched like in one direction than the other, it's okay to bias out a little more. You may be tighter in that area, but don't ignore all aspects of the stretch. Make sure to go through your full rotation or your full side to side movement while you're doing your stretches. All right, so for our frequency and like hold time with our stretches, um, I always recommend starting off with gentle stretching, maybe even two or three times per day. Try and spread it out throughout the day so you're not just doing it in the morning. Start with a few shorter holds, like five to 10 seconds, and then work up into one or two longer holds up to 30 seconds. So in the subacute phase, we can also start some gentle strengthening for hip extension and knee flexion. We're gonna do isometrics though with this to start off. So to do these isometrics, it's kind of like our test that we talked about where you're gonna push against an immobile object. This is gonna allow you to generate some force before you go into harder later exercises. So you're gonna do that test like you did, but slowly increase the amount of force till it feels comfortable. You wanna be able to do these isometrics at or near 100% force without pain before we go into our moderate strengthening exercises. All right, so for frequency sets and reps, with these more gentle early exercises, you can do them daily, maybe even twice a day, performing sets of 10 reps, holding maybe three to five seconds. And as we mentioned just a second ago, when you can do those without pain, you're gonna to wanna to move on to the hip extension and knee flexion with a band, which is gonna be our more moderate strengthening. Okay, so moving on from our gentle, like isometric exercises into our moderate band exercises. This is probably still gonna be around the late subacute phase, and by that I mean like week three, kind of blending into week four, we go on to these resisted hip extension and knee flexion exercises with a band. The hip extension one is simply gonna be in placing a band around both ankles. You're gonna stand and extend one leg back behind you. Now I often recommend like having a counter or a table in front of you because most people are gonna try and lean forward too much to get more distance of their hip to extend further behind them. You don't need to do that. You just wanna kick it lightly behind you, engaging both your butt and the back of your leg, holding that for a couple of seconds, repeating. All right, so now for the knee flexion with the band, you're simply gonna stand on the band with one leg. So it'll be under your foot on one leg and on the ankle on the other. The leg that has the band on the ankle, you're simply gonna pull your knee up like you're trying to touch your heel to your butt. Now this is gonna get harder and harder the closer you get. So you know, use the right band resistance for this as well. Again, we want about 12 to 16 reps of it and make sure it's pain free. Now I want you to do like 12 to 16 reps or so of this because we're trying to encourage good blood flow. So if you can't do that, you need to use a lighter band so we can fall in that intensity range. If you're getting 16 reps, great. Good blood flow, good regenerative properties. It's gonna help speed up your recovery period. Since we're moving more into moderates here, we're maybe not doing this every day, probably every other day, allowing for proper rest in between. Especially as you increase the difficulty, you need to increase the amount of rest time you have. So if you feel great, you know, you can do it five times a week or so, but if you need the rest, take the rest because your body's trying to tell you it's still recovering from that injury. All right, so as we progress through the subacute phase safely and we're entering into that chronic or remodeling phase, we wanna start rehabbing the injury by doing functional training and training that will cause additional tissue adaptation to help restore our normal function and prevent a future injury. This will all be accomplished by doing a stiff leg deadlift and the Nordic curl. So the stiff leg deadlift is gonna be done on a single leg. Why a single leg? Well, it's just more functional for climbing. We don't often do like double heel hooks with climbing. Double heel hooks. So your, your setup is gonna be starting by standing on a single leg. You're gonna engage your core like you're pulling on a tight pair of jeans. And then you're gonna squeeze your buttocks a little bit, okay? So what you're gonna do next is 
Lean straight forward, bending at the hips, not at the lower back. You're gonna reach both hands down towards the ground, stopping once you feel tension in the, the hamstring or the back of the thigh. You may feel it down by your knee, like kind of into the calf, which is fine. You wanna use that tension to lift yourself back up. That part's really important. You don't wanna lift back up with your lower back. So you wanna go down till you feel that slight stretch, you feel that pull or that stretch in the back of the leg, use that to pull yourself back up. You wanna come fully erect or back to that upright position before you do your next repetition. Now, as we talked about earlier, you know, not wanting to be unidimensional, when we go back down for our second rep, we're gonna reach both hands slightly to the left. All right, so now this is gonna cause rotation as we talked about earlier, which the hamstrings help with. So same thing, keep the core engaged, back is flat, use the pull to lift yourself back up, and then your back standing fully erect. Finally, we do it to complete the exercise, reaching to the right. You've now done three reps or one cycle. I usually say to do three or four cycles, which would be nine to 12 repetitions. If you feel like you're using your lower back, you need to kind of reset, rebuild that tension in your core, and make sure you're using the pull in the back of the leg to lift yourself back up. All right, the Nordic curls. Oh, I love this exercise, it's so good. If you see me at the crag doing Nordies, you know what to do. Just hop on in and join me. All right, so for Nordies, there are really two setups. Usually you would need like a partner or something, some kind of like heavy weighted system or something to hold on like through your heels or lower leg. If you don't have that, the other setup is just using a wall. For both setups, you're gonna to wanna to use a pad underneath your knees so you're not putting too much pressure on them. Now, as you go through the Nordi, you wanna set up by engaging your core, squeezing the glutes, and then keeping your hamstrings nice and strong. Start with just that little rock forward and then pull yourself back up. So you can kind of see what a safe range of motion is for you. Especially in the first set, you don't wanna go super far because you're more likely to kind of cramp up with the exercise. If you do, just go to the ground, try and straighten your leg all the way out. For some alternates with these Nordies, we can do a single leg or we can alter the angle of it. For the single leg, I always like to say like, find your range or your depth that you can go through and then go to about 50 to 60% of that range. When you're at that range, simply lift one leg off the wall so you're then loading up one leg. This is super important for climbing because as we mentioned before, oftentimes, unless we're doing like a really like high compression climb, we're doing one heel hook at a time. So we wanna be able to train that isolated strength on each leg and it'll help you identify any weaknesses between your left and right legs. The other version with that rotation, again, you're gonna to wanna to go to about 50 to 60%, and then you're gonna try and like rotate your body one direction or the other, which will load up one side more, but now we're getting that rotation that the body has to control, which again is gonna help with your climbing. Okay, so for like sets and reps of this, I'm gonna say about eight to 12 repetitions is great. Um, three to four sets, I always like to get that fourth one when you're later in your rehab program. Otherwise, just do those three sets. Now we're gonna decrease the frequency even further for both the Nordies and the stiff leg deadlift because we don't really want to overload the tissue too much. So I'd say two or three times a week is great frequency, allowing for plenty of rest time. You'll probably also notice more soreness, but the good kind, the muscle soreness, because we're now doing higher level activities, so that rest period becomes even more important. All right, so for prevention, fortunately the research out there is quite clear in many regards. The way to prevent a hamstring injury is to train them. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is where the first mistake is made and is the first component of a prevention program, simply training the hamstrings. I mean, how many people actually focus on training their hamstrings for climbing? Sadly, it's pretty low, which is crazy because they're so important for climbing. Another mistake in the second component of a prevention program is not working all the muscles of the hamstring group. 
As you should understand by now, we need to train the hamstrings in multiple positions in multiple angles. The best approach is to include both straight and bent leg activities, which incorporate multiple planes of motion, such as the ones we discussed earlier. Now, I've already mentioned I'm a huge fan of the Nordic Curl because of its close proximity to what we do with heel hooks and rock climbing. It has also been shown time and time again and had preventative effects when studied in different athletic populations across the board. Now, that's not to say that the straight leg one is not important as well, and that's the third component of our prevention program. We want to do straight leg eccentrics. Research has shown that working the long chain, which means working the muscle group in a lengthened position, rather than a shortened one is also an effective way of preventing a hamstring injury. And it also makes sense for climbing, right? Because you may start with that like deep heel hook, but as you move further out in the climb, your heel hook extends out. Finally, the fourth component is simply properly warming up your hamstrings before climbing. This will go a long way towards preventing an injury, whether it's just like five to 10 minutes on the bike, if you're at the gym, or just doing some mini nordies while you're out at the crag. Warm up those hamstrings before you decide to place half of your body weight on them, please. In summary of our prevention program, we need to actually incorporate hamstring training into our training programs. We need to, complete, to do complete exercises, including nordies and straight leg hamstring activities. We need to do long chain eccentrics, and we need to actually warm up before expecting them to handle our fat butts. All right, so we've talked about so much in this video. We reviewed anatomy, causes of injury, treatment, and injury prevention. I hope you come away from this video with a new appreciation and understanding of the wonderful hamstrings that help us crush some pebbles. They will improve your technique and allow you to heel hook with the best of them. Thanks for watching another episode of Pooper's Beta. And until next time, train, climb, send, repeat. Got it. <laughs>